Hello, it's Dr. Ken here with my teaching assistant, Bear, who will be advising us along the way for my with lecture for my Chaucer's England class that I'm calling Satirical Space. Now, what does this mean? We have encountered satire before um, in the mock heroism lecture and, and seminar and in others as well. Um, but, and I, and I defined it as, as that which reveals the gap between the ideal and the real. And that is what satire does. But this is something we need to think about because those who create satire do so to emphasize the fact that the world is not as it's supposed to be, or indeed as people say it ought to be. Um, there is that gap, and so satire uh, draws it out. We'll look at some other examples of a very obvious satire, and we've seen some in Chaucer already, but um, we're looking primarily today at what, what are called the marginalia. And I'm extending the definition of this beyond the written page to include things like misericords, which we'll think about in a moment, um, and a few other things. So things in the margins, in other words. And that's what the word means, marginalia. It's marginalia. It's Latin. Things in the margins, um, which can include manuscripts, uh, but can also include possibly, well, stained glass windows and misericords and a range of other things. So we'll be talking about those and how we interpret them, um, and and there is no consensus on universally on how to interpret these things. Unfortunately, I'm suggesting, as the title of the lecture indicates, that this is some form of satire, um, and I think that's probably true in a lot of cases, though though probably not in all cases. So there is some uncertainty about what the marginalia signify. Now, um, you'll be seeing on your screen a number of things. I've, I've put up some songs that would have been popular uh, at the time, roughly around the time of Chaucer. These are not songs that would have been necessarily sung in the presence of the nobility, <clears throat> but possibly in taverns um, and, and you know, other, other more, more lower class settings amongst the, 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 the commoners. So um, I'm not going to read them out. I'll, I'll let you do that. You can pause the video if you want to read these things. But um, the first one is, is fairly straightforward, and you can see the kind of puns that are being made about the, 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 um, the cockerel, the bird, um, and, and how that works in that little song, which must have, must have you know, resulted in ribald laughter when it was sung in a pub. Here's one about young men, I warn you, um, and this would seem to be partly in keeping with some themes that we've encountered already about avoiding marrying someone uh, significantly older than yourself. Sir Penny, um, which illustrates a point that the more things change, the more they stay the same. <clears throat> this is about um, a, uh, well, this, as the song indicates, as the song seems to indicate um, about how money may be used to get a person out of trouble, to avoid the law, etc., etc. Um, one of the line, lines go, um, how is it? And, and when I have none in my purse, penny better nor penny worse, for me they have but little respect. Um, so when you've got no money, things are obviously bad. When you've got some, you can buy lawyers and, and get out of trouble. Chapman, the next one, uh, which again seems to be making some sexual innuendos, which you can see there quite clearly. And again, I'll let you read that in your own time. A lot of, a lot of very sexual, scatological language. So this brings us on to the lecture themes of today. Um, so we're going to talk about the misericords and marginal illustrations, certain recurring themes in art and literature. We'll explore some interpretations of what function the mar marginalia served. Um, are they satirical challenges to the church and social order? Pardon me. Or, are they, or, or do they operate alongside these things? We'll talk about mystery plays a little bit. We've, we've done this, we've touched on this before. Um, and we'll, we'll think about that um, 
and we'll look also at Chaucer and, and the marginalia and, and, and whether we think Chaucer was a radical writer. So um, the next few images that you're going to see contain examples of misericords. What is a misericord? Uh, so these are seats that were made for the clergy to mainly to lean against. And seat is perhaps an over grandiose term, overly grandiose. Uh, they're, they're shelves essentially that priests could and monks could lean upon uh, whilst giving some of these long masses that are required. You know, they're, they're being paid to to sing 30 masses or to say 30 masses rather or sing the Psalter to get someone's soul out of um, purgatory. Um, but they can't be expected to stand up a whole time and do that. So these shelves were, were made for them. And, and these are things the church is, you know, paid for people to, to make. Um, so assu we assume they would have had some say in what was designed upon them. Uh, although that's by no means clear. Um, so when we look at them, and we'll see some more examples in a minute, they mostly depict non-religious things. They, they often depict violence of some type or another, um, or, or some kind of sinful activity. Often sexual themes are portrayed on them, uh, or exaggerations. So you'll see the one there of the, the fox uh, in the pulpit giving a sermon to some, what well, looks like a duck and a chicken. This is very strange, um, you know. What, what's what's the what, why do this? And I mean, again, there there are several interpretations of, of what this might mean. Um, one has to do with, you know, these are these are depicting the sort of things that the priests, the, the members of the, the clergy, are avoiding by being in the clergy, maybe to remind them of you know how good they've got it. Um, others could be for um, could be for entertainment. I mean, bear in mind these, these are, are shelves that you wouldn't necessarily see unless you were looking for them. So you wouldn't see these carvings unless you happen to be, you know, looking explicitly for them. They're in, they're in often sort of uh, uh, galleries or, or or you know like choir stalls. So um, they're not necessarily on prominent display, and it, and it might be that, that it requires someone to, to actually bend down to have a look, and, and I don't know if this is what they were doing. Um, if, if the priest, you know, while they were meant to be saying their 30 masses or whatever, uh, decided to have a lie down on the floor and gaze up at these, at these images and, and let their imaginations run wild. Um, we simply don't know. Um, it looks like the wood carvers were given sort of free reign, you know, over over the images. And is that is that where they come from? Is it the carvers themselves having a laugh, or did the priests, the the church, ask for these things to be portrayed? We we don't know, but they are more or less universal. Um, and I think the earliest that we see them, sort of, twelfth century, a bit earlier than that, onwards. Um, and they're in monastic foundations, churches, etc. Um, again, very strange. So we'll go through, we'll, we'll think about misericords and marginalia. Um, you'll see the image there as well of, this is like a cartoon. So if you imagine the boy in the image, it's actually just one boy. He's doing something to a, to a, to a basket and he's giving the basket to a woman. Um, that's in the marginalia of, of a manuscript. But again, the themes are similar. <clears throat> so sexual, scatological, um, sometimes violence, sometimes grotesques and absurd things. So in the next slide, you'll be seeing a number of images. Um, I'll just point out the one in the lower middle and in the, in the middle itself. That comes from York Minster. Those are stained glass windows depicting the so-called monkey funeral, which is meant to be somehow a kind of aping, if you like, of the uh, of the funeral of the Virgin Mary. So um, we see these sort of things, as I say, in lots of different religious contexts, particularly religious contexts, um, and 
you know, what, as I say, what, what is the interpretation of these things? Uh, hard to say. Um, in the case of misericords, and you can see some examples there in the slide, as I say, they're for priests to lean against, or monks whilst giving, or friars potentially as well, whilst giving uh, these prayers for those who have paid for them. And, you know, why, why are they doing this? Uh, why are they embellishing them so much with strange things? You know, like I say, one interpretation is that it's, it's down to the carvers themselves. Pardon me, but I, I do wonder, I suspect that the, the clergy must have had, excuse me, some say in the matter because they were paying for it. What sort of subjects do they contain? Well, um, they vary quite considerably. Some of it comes from medieval folklore. Uh, Aesop's fables is, is a popular source. Um, musical pigs, this is an allegorical uh, relationship to lust or, or greed. You know, recollecting some of the deadly sins with animals, apes in particular seem to signify, uh, you know, human foibles. Often apes with 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 um, urine bottles, uh, as if sort of taking the Mickey out of the medical profession. Mermaids, the Green Man, a lot of earlier pagan stuff um, appears as well, uh, which which have you know again and. and wives beating their husbands or other sexual scenes which don't seem to relate in any any sense really to the clergy um those are the you know the marginalia and we've got the stained glass windows but then we have also the or i should say those are the misericords we also have marginalia in manuscripts um as well and you know we've seen the latrell psalter already um we will be looking at some more images from that shortly but you know, one, again, one interpretation is that they may well have a deeper meaning. So these these aren't necessarily just random things. Some of them might be, but the marginalia seem to have a deeper meaning. Um, so one scholar named Lillian Randall traces some of the typical scenes found in the margins of manuscripts to exemplar stories used in the sermons uh, by preaching friars. So, and, and this, this sort of course, the, the preaching friars correspond with roughly the time when we start finding marginalia. Are they connected? It's entirely possible. Um, often the illustrations in the margins can be tracked down to proverbs, fables, as well as bestiaries, books of, of animals. Um, in, in, more, in most cases, with a kind of moral twist being added to the story. They operate in different ways from the text itself, and we're talking about manuscripts in particular, um, they can they can be used to throw light on the text, they, they might reinforce the meaning of the main text, or to give a particular inflection of meaning, uh, so, so they, they, they can have a purpose. Then we have the monkey funeral in York Minster. Uh, it's on the pilgrimage window, as it's, as it's sometimes called. It has the scenes of monkey medics examining urine flasks, um, and the monkey funeral in the borders. So again, marginalia, but in stained glass. On one level, it's a parody of the funeral of the Virgin Mary. Um, there might be some sort of message here about spiritual health. Not sure souls being saved by pilgrimage, etc. Christ is the good physician, whereas the monkeys are false medics. They're false. They're, they're, they're not being saved because they're just they're they're doing. They're sort of exaggerated human vices. Um, a kind of medieval hypertext is one way to interpret this, creating meanings that are hidden to the unlearned and and inattentive. Um, if we look at the Latrell Psalter again, th there are lots of examples of, of the labors depicted here of the different months of the year. Um, the sequence of sh scenes show the cycle of the year, uh, the natural cycle of, of, of you know winter, spring, summer, etc. Uh, marginalia, though, in in the Latrell Psalter are quite strange, and, and as I say, we'll look at some examples of this in a in a bit. I think have we got one? No, no. We'll come back to that in, in a bit. Another one is the um, the Ormsby Psalter as well. We'll, we'll have a look at that. To, uh, or sorry, we'll, we'll come back to that um, in a moment. 
I should say Reynard the Fox is a theme that occurs in the Luttrell Psalter um, and in a lot of marginalia as well. So having that, having be, being aware of that story is quite helpful in understanding, I think, these things. Um, and this theme of foxes preaching to geese, again, or, or to farm animals, is a recurring theme uh, throughout. So in the, in the choir stalls of Winchester Cathedral, um, there are some examples of this. And you can see more about this in the notes. I don't want to go on and on about it, but there, there are lots and lots of examples. Um, it's debatable how far we can read specific symbolism into these marginalia, though. Uh, and there are sort of two extremes of interpretation. Early 20th century scholars looking at manuscripts dismissed the marginalia as whimsy, irrelevant, uh, meaningless distractions. And I'm, I'm not saying that some of them aren't. They might well be. On the other hand, some 19th century uh, architects claim, uh, aim to read each and every carving as a symbol of Christian doctrine, uh, which may overdetermine their significance a, a, a little bit. Probably the truth is somewhere between the two. We don't know. I think we probably have to take every instance as it is for what it's worth and to consider its own peculiar background and history. Um, rather than making some kind of some kind of sweeping generalization. So uh, the, another one that's, that's filled with, with marginalia is the Gray Fitzpain Book of Hours. Um, this was meant to be a wedding gift uh, which honored the marriage of Sir Richard de Grey of Condor, Condor Castle, Derbyshire, to Joan Fitzpain of Dorsetshire. Um, took place. The wedding was sometime in between 1300 and 1301. Uh, and this was in honor of the Book of Hours. It consists of prayers for the different hours of the day, so matins, lords, prime, terse, and sext, uh, non and vespers, which were said in the early hours. We're not sure that everyone did this, but, but some devout people probably did. There's lots of, 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 there are lots of grotesques in, in the marginalia of this, of this book, and we'll look at some of those in a bit, um, including rabbits crouching behind a deer that's been struck by an archer, a lion, a fox-like animal looking on, a goat climbing the outer margin, um, etc., etc. Three hunting scenes are, are, are depicted. We'll look at the Ormsby Psalter as well. This is a 14th century illumination on parchment. It's currently in the Bodleian Library, um, which again depicts amongst other things a body betrothal so sexual stuff we'll look at the Gorleston Psalter as well um, made in the early 14th century for the church of Gorleston in Norfolk which is rich in illustrations and this was commissioned by lay patrons so that's interesting too it's not just in things made solely for the clergy we'll look at some other Psalters and books of ours um, along the way. So think about like as we'll, we'll think about the mystery plays as well. So I mean one, one theory or one idea is that there's a kind of post black death dramatic style associated with the mystery plays uh, which may also find its way into other marginalia um, and and, and the kind of omnipresent possibility of sudden and painful death increased the religious desire for penitence, but it also seems to have invoked, evoked a historical desire for amusement while still possible. A kind of last dance is cold comfort, perhaps. So we get the, the dance macabre. We've seen that before already. Um, and it might be that that too, that the post-Black Death environment has something to do with the marginalia, although some of the marginalia was around before then, it really seems to take off afterwards. Um, we'll think about those things. What are the kind of recurring themes? Well, you have riding backwards on animals. That seems to be a common one. You can you'll maybe see some examples of it later on. Um, parodying people, you know, creating parodies of knights, physicians, uh, priests, bishops. Again, some kind of criticism, some kind of satire. Representing the stupidity of human beings, perhaps. Um, 
representing uncontrolled sexual appetites or others of the seven deadly sins. Um, so, and, and apes as well. Again, apes seem to represent those things, those characteristics of, of human vice, exaggerated. Um, they're usually considered, well, they're, they're, they're friendly with the fox, the apes, apparently, in, in the marginalia. Uh, enemy of most birds except owls, which owls in medieval symbolism signify spiritual blindness for some reason. Um, monkeys are also, and apes are, are, are considered stupid in vain and can be trapped with mirrors, which sometimes happens in the marginalia. We'll come back to some other examples of those. Other themes, um, as I say, Markov the Fool. So we're familiar with Solomon and Markov. We've looked at this story before. Um, you have the, pardon me, the low-born peasant Markov who outsmarts the clever, rich, aristocrat King Solomon. That seems to be a popular theme, and, and there you can see an example in the slide, or several examples, of Markov the Fool being depicted in, in, in different texts. Um, which, 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 you know, again, aren't necessarily about that story. It's a, it's a kind of um, inclusion for some reason in there. And then there's Reynard the Fox, who um, who's probably one of the better exemplars of satire um, as, as a kind of peasant hero character. And so the story of the preaching fox found in Reynard literature uh, was used in church art by the, by the Catholic Church as, as propaganda against the Lollards, amongst other things. So some of this marginalia uh, showing depicting foxes as priests preaching to farm animals um, is, is perhaps aimed at the Lollards. And that, that's, that, so we could find the significance of that, perhaps. Um, the fox preaches to geese, hoping to entice them into his mouth. Uh, and this preaching fox satir also satirizes the gullible congregation. Uh, so cunning deceivers. Um, not all of them necessarily refer to the Lollards, but you know some of them are just warnings about clergy who have strayed from the way. Remember, this is a period in which heresy is is, is heresy's always been an issue within the church. Um, it will pick up a pace obviously during the Reformation a bit later but it's perhaps a way for the church that this this type of marginalia might be a way of warning people about heretics deceiving them but again we're not entirely sure it could also just be criticism of you know priests who um, as we know in the 14th century weren't always the best quality individuals I'm sure we could think of examples from Chaucer's Canterbury Tales where the priest or, the, or a priestly figure is not unlike the fox trying to deceive for his own ends. We'll next look at some examples of misericords. Um, <clears throat> and these, <clears throat> pardon me, these will illustrate the points that I've been trying to make. So there's a scene of domestic violence. It looks like a man and woman, presumably married man and woman, fighting, um, which, you know, again, has no real place within the church for members of the clergy who are never going to get married or aren't supposed to at any rate. Perhaps it's a warning, perhaps it's a way of saying, look out, you know, this is what could happen if you leave the church, or aren't you lucky you haven't left the church? Don't know. Uh, here's some other examples of foxes preaching to geese. We've seen lots of these already, but two of those are on misericords, um, and one is on a manuscript. It's in the left-hand side of the one upper right. Right, this one appears to be um, one person using a billows, and if you don't know what a billows is, uh, it's a kind of an air pump designed to to make the fires start quicker. Um, but this person seems to be using the the billows um, to as a kind of enema, perhaps I don't know, uh, shoving up someone's posterior. Again, why do you think this would be in a religious context? A knight riding backwards. Um, as I say, this seems to be a recurring theme. <clears throat> and, and how do we interpret it? Well, 
it's the world turned upside down, it's things not as they ought to be. It might be this sort of satire that's pointing out the gap between the real and the ideal. Um, it might refer to something specific that we're not familiar with, that we just have lost through time. But it certainly seems to portray the world differently from how it should be. This next one depicts a scene of violence. Um, it looks like a rather aristocratic figure uh, in the middle, or three of them, unless it's meant to be one person. We can sometimes take these as cartoons, um, but hard to say. So if you, if you look at the figure on the left, it looks like the man in the middle has threatened him. Uh, but on the right, it looks like he's lost his sword. So I'm not sure what's going on there, but it's a scene of violence of some kind, whether that's meant to be one, two, three, four, five people, or just two people in some kind of cartoon sequence. I don't know, um, but there you go. I'm not particularly religious. So this one um, <clears throat> is kind of hard to make out, actually, but it, you can see, you're looking at it from above. That's a knight being roasted on his own sword, as if it were a spit, with a rabbit doing the roasting. So there are pots there with, with meat and stuff in them, and there's a knight being roasted by a rabbit, which again is, you know, the world turned upside down, opposite to the way it's supposed to be. Hell in a handcart. So here we have what looked like a bunch of um, monks or friars in a, a large handcart being taken off to hell by a demon. Um, again, some kind of warning. Could it be that the figures represent real people? Hard to say. This is, I'm calling the battle of the sexes. So you've got a woman on a pig and a man riding what looks, to, looks like a very large, either a turkey or a rooster. Um, and it looks like they're jousting with, with sort of domestic equipment. So this would seem to symbolically indicate some kind of, uh, again, marital conflict. Um, assuming it's a man and a woman, I, I think we must assume they're probably married engaged in, in, in fighting each other. A bit like knights, they're having a joust, but, but in, in a very unknightly manner. So the next is, is, is could be described as a kind of monstrous bishop figure. Um, it, 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 it's, a, it's a grotesque, it's half beast, but with the bishop's head, he's clearly a bishop, he's wearing a mitre. So, you know, could it be the people who um, paid for this said, put, put the bishop's face on it, he's a bad guy? We don't know. Again, we, we simply don't know the answer to this, but it, it's a very strange thing to find in a church. The next one depicts a tournament. Um, so again, some kind of violence, but you know, not what we would expect in a religious context. And the last one is an unusual musical instrument. Um, I'll let you perhaps try and determine what you think that signifies. And again, think about why this is carved onto a misericord um, for a priest to lean against, you know, or, or is he having a little lie down in the stalls and having a look at it and, and getting some sort of perverse pleasure from it? Maybe, that's one interpretation. We simply don't know. So, now we'll move on again to this notion of interpretation. <clears throat> what function does the marginalia serve? And one function it might serve is to subvert and satirize authorities. I've been suggesting that a lot of this might be um, talking about you know, some kind of satire, um, but, but then siding with what's good and normal. So this is a, one interpretation is that by depicting all of these horrendous things, um, and, and bizarre behavior and, and very negative behavior. Um, it, it's a way of showing you, by example, you know, what not to do. Um, but we find other things in the margins too, not just sort of moral exemplar. We find a number of complaints and marginal notes by the monks assigned to copy manuscripts in the era before the printing press. Um, some some of the examples of this, and these are things they've scribbled in the margins. I am very cold. Oh, my hand hurts. Um, and and there's another one that says, Now I've written the whole thing. For Christ's sake, give me a drink. 
These are lovely and lively interjections. They represent just a small range of, of expressions uh, that one finds throughout medieval manuscripts. As Michael Camille documents in his Images on the Edge, the margins of medieval art, um, that's the title of his book, it is these marginal comments that we in them that we learn as much, if not more, about the medieval world than we do from the text themselves. So marginalia might include comments like the ones mentioned above, um, but also an entire free-flowing range of artistic flourishes and doodles that make up the edges of medieval manuscripts. Once the manuscript page becomes a kind of matrix, that's something that encloses something, of visual signs, um, and is, is no longer you know, one of flowing linear speech, as Michael Camille writes, the stage is set not only for supplementation and annotation, but also for disagreement and juxtaposition, what the scholastics call disputatio. <clears throat> so the, the the page of marginal, the page of, of a manuscript in particular, has a written text that follows in a linear fashion, to be sure, but it also has all this other stuff that, that codes in extra information. Uh, marginal illustrations could be profane and bizarre. One manuscript of the Romance of Lancelot shows a nun breastfeeding a monkey. Another marginal image from the Rutland Psalter features a demon of some sort for, uh, firing an arrow into the arse of a merman. You can see that in the slide. What does that mean? Pardon me. Michael Camille cautions against reading such images as violations of the sacred text because the medieval world was so rigidly hierarchized and structured, resisting, ridiculing, overturning, and inventing was only possible, well, not only possible, it was limitless. Uh, and again, to reinforce, you know, the, the official view. Um, we should not see medieval culture exclusively in terms of binary oppositions like sacred and profane, for example, or spiritual and worldly. This is Camille's interpretation. Travesty, profanation, and sacrilege are essential to the continuity of the sacred in society. So in other words, they need these things, the darker side, in order to reinforce the light. You need the devil to, as it were, scare people to be faithful to God. Um, and a 1323 missile, uh, illuminated by this uh, treatise, illuminated by one Petrus de Rambucor, uh, for example, contains uh, a picture of a scribe harassed by monkeys while he tries to copy. They mimic him, they drink his ink, they distract him. One moons him, an obscene gesture suggested by, this, by the suggestive line break in the Latin above the words culpa, which means sin, um, is cut at cool. And, and so he, what, what's happened here is that the, and I think you can actually see it in the illustration, culpa, uh, it's one line going down to the other, it, 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 it lends a second interpretation to the word. Uh, so it could read, liber est acul, which means the book is to the, to the arse, um, which is not what it's meant to say, but that's one, that, but because of the way the, the, the illustrator has decided to portray it, um, it can read as, as that. So there's another one, um, a manuscript of the Romance of the Rose, a 13th century epic begun by Guillaume de Loris and finished by Jean de Mun. Um, very popular and important at the time, at least as popular as the Canterbury Tales and Dante's Divine Comedy. Uh, it offers a straightforward, if increasingly lengthy and digressive love story, courtly love, um, before ultimately, uh, well, you have a lover who, who scales a castle um, for the love of a woman, um, for his beloved awaits him. It's, it's a narrative of and, and about the aristocracy. No servants exist in, in the story. Um, it's an allegory, a symbolic representation of courtly love. Uh, so you don't find members of the lower classes represented here, but what you do find in the marginalia, um, and it's it's um, depicted in that image in the, the upper right-hand corner of the slide. I'll put another version of it up for you to see. It shows the the illuminators themselves copying the book. They they've, they've written themselves into it. Um, 
While the text itself focused around the aristocratic world, it was obviously copied and made by tradespeople and the working classes, um, and one finds these in marginal notes and images in subtle reflection on the power structure inherent in the medieval manuscript. The artists who painted these images were sometimes servants in the retinue of nobility, but even those who were professionals were lower on the social scale than those for whom they worked. Um, so this image from the Romance of the Rose held in the Bibliothèque Nationale uh, France is illustrated by this husband and wife team, Richard and Jean Montbaston. In the bottom margin of a single page, they've incorporated a self-portrait of themselves, with Richard copying the letters while Jean illustrates. Um, while they appear initially as nothing more than a visual signature, their presence undermines, or could be said to undermine, the entire work of the epic, pointing to a world beyond the allegory of the romance, uh, with its gardens of pleasure and castles of jealousy, uh, in a world of women treated seriously, sorry, variously as, as deceitful liars or sex objects, Jean's presence as a worker and as an artist in her own right questions much of the assumptions of the romances that the romances authors make. Um, now, does does it take a modern scholar to 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 see how these images sort of undermine, perhaps? That, that sort of aristocratic theme? Maybe not, because um, it, it's, it's like, imagine a stage drama. Um, you know, behind the scenes, there's a lot going on. There are people pulling ropes, there, there are special effects, there are, are, are st set workers going on and off stage, dressed in black, putting stuff out, taking stuff away. You know, you see the show, but all this other stuff is going on behind the scenes. That's what this image illustrates, how um, yes, you've got the story of the romance and its high-flung courtly love theme, but we've also got these craftsmen um, who, who made it, you know, without which it could not exist, uh, and and they're depicted in it, and, and perhaps it does undermine, and perhaps self-consciously so. So... Um, if some of the marginalia is meant to satirize the social order in the church, uh, that's, you know, again, an interpretation. Is it a counterculture suppressed beneath the backsides of the clergy? Thinking about the, you know, the, uh, the misericords in particular. Um, is it a new politicized art form? Maybe, but, you know, you'd think we'd hear more about it if that were the case. Certainly, there is increased trade amongst craftsmen. Some of the craftsmen designing these marginalia will have come from Europe and brought designs with them. Others will have gone back to Europe or to the continent. We're in Europe, of course, but to the continent itself. Uh, there's a lot of cross-pollination of ideas. Um, and also, with more money in circulation, not just in England but elsewhere too, it, it, people are paying money, obviously, as we saw before, for these sorts of things to be made. Um, I've put some other themes up here on the slide, which you can think about. Whether, whether or not these have anything to do with marginalia, it pro they probably do. I think they are symbolic of the changing of the times, but um, it's... yeah... One question is, was art on the margins the only satirical space available? Possibly. You know, I mean, the aristocrats in, 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 in the feudal society, although the feudal society is, is you know, being eroded away, um, they don't tolerate criticism very much. So some of this, the, the criticism that we see may be going under their radar. And that may be the only way that this sort of criticism can come out. Mentioned mystery plays earlier. Um, I put on the slide in, you know, a number of things. Uh, we, we could compare them with pantomimes. Uh, they're a little bit like the marginalia too in that they're mainly for the common people um, and you know, might depict certain things and even some of the, the type of things that we find in other marginalia um, for the common people. So they're, they're sponsored by the church. These are traveling street theaters they use religious stories, uh, mostly the lives of saints or the life of Jesus, life of Christ. And it's been 
characterize a sort of pantomime like you'll note in the slide that different colors signify different things and, and, and the music as well um, an emblem so there's a, there's a coded symbolism to this that we don't necessarily get um, but they would have gotten interesting connection though uh, between the mystery plays and the marginalia so what we find is things that were regularly depicted in mystery plays appear sometimes in the marginalia on misericords in particular um, so popular stories that are not part of the gospels um, they link up to misericord carvings uh, often themes of domestic tension so remember noah and his wife in at least in the marginalia sorry in the um in, in the mystery plays and miracle plays his wife is an indomitable scold they argue she she almost refuses to get on the ark that much that was very popular and it, it gets played up a lot in the mystery plays it also comes out again in the marginalia and you can see that roof boss again which i'm counting as a kind of marginalia too but on misericords as well um we get them referenced in the Canterbury Tales. Here's a quote uh, from one of the mystery plays. This is Noah talking to his wife. Noah says, You men that, that have wives whilst you're young, if you love but your lives, chastise your tongue, chastise their tongue, the wives' tongues. Noah's wife responds, Lord, would I be easy and full of good cheer? Might I have but one meal of true widow's fare? For thy soul without loss would I pay for a prayer? So would others, no doubt, that I see this place of wives that are here for the lives that they lead, wish their husbands were dead. Um, so domestic, domestic struggles, domestic conflict seem to figure prominently into the marginalia. Um, and of course, they're, they're done by people in, their, in, in contemporary local accents. As I say, there are references to these in the Canterbury Tales. The wife of Bath likes to go to the mystery plays. The miller speaks with Pilate's voice. Pontius Pilate's character apparently had a very loud, booming voice. Those were the stage directions. Absalom, we might recall, plays Herod, King Herod of Jerusalem in the mystery plays. Um, and, of course, the miller's tale uh, deals with Noah's flood, which is a popular theme. As I say, um, it, the, the, there's a visual culture in the Middle Ages which was, was more accessible to them than to us. And I put some here in the books about Marjorie Kemp and um, Dame Julian of Norwich. These I include in, in this on Marginalia because they... Well, they're women writers, you know, in a time when we don't find many women writers, and, and, and in a sense, they themselves are marginal um, and, and depicting, you know, very religious themes. So the book of Marjorie Kemp, written probably in the late 1430s, um, is considered one of the most astonishing documents of late medieval, medieval English life. Uh, Marjorie Kemp represents herself as an ultimate, as the ultimate author. Uh, she's not a, simply a woman, but a woman thoroughly rooted in the world. Um, and she had been, I think, quite a prominent, um, quite a prominent merchant for a while. Uh, a member of the powerful guild of the Holy Trinity in the prosperous East Anglian town of Bishop's Lynn. She was she was wealthy but then writes about the lives of saints. And of course, you can imagine the versions of the, the, the text that would have been produced would have been heavily embellished. Um, we don't know a lot more about her, but she, she's interesting. You know, in, in that Marjorie... Well, she, she in, in the book, at, at any rate, she seems to gradually move away from worldly things to more spiritual. The next one uh, is The Revelations of Divine Love by Dame Julian of Norwich. Um, Julian was a Christian... Ooh. <laughs> she was a Christian myth mystic. Um, it's, be it's believed to be the first published book in the, the English language written by a woman. So at the age of 30, 
In 1373, she was struck with a serious illness, um, prayed for death. She received a series of 16 visions, we're told, on the Passion of Christ and the Virgin Mary. And then she claims the Virgin Mary saved her from the brink of death. Uh, and she dedicates her life to solitary prayer. Um, she wrote in Middle English, again, so a bit, bit like Chaucer. Uh, and, and, and she will have seen a lot uh, during her time. Her, her Norwich was devastated by the Black Death. She was known as an anchorite, by the way. So she, she spent her life alone. She wasn't she wasn't a member of the clergy, but she 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 went into seclusion, into a kind of cell where people would bring to her food. Um, and she's considered one of the greatest of the English uh, mystics, venerated in both Anglican and Lutheran churches. Um, and she wrote this revelations of divine love about 1393 so th these are women on the margin of society yet contributing significantly to it these probably should have they probably should have talked about these a bit more in the sex and gender one i think i might have mentioned them there as well but they are interesting characters and as i say they, they belong to the margins because there's, there's no one else really like them. There, there, where, there are obviously other prominent female figures in this period, but um, female writers are, are very few and far between. But here we have two, both sort of roughly the same era. Is this significant? Does it signify something about um, the changes that are taking place in the world? Quite possibly. I will now go through um, a number of other images that we'll talk about that illustrate marginalia in, um, in the existing manuscripts. So this is from the Gray Fitzpain Book of Hours. Remember, Book of Hours contains prayers uh, for the different times of the day. And it's, it's, this one's extremely well illustrated, richly illustrated. You can see in, in this an example of a monk, looks like hunting so Chaucer's monk being fond of hunting doesn't seem to be that unusual a theme but there are all sorts of other weird things in the margins that, that just don't really make a lot of sense to us so there's a close-up of that monk hunting um, doing unmonk like things and, and creatures that probably wouldn't normally be together in that scene some other examples from the Gray Fitzpain Book of Hours. Move on to the Luttrell Psalter. And we've, we've looked at this before, but we haven't looked this closely. So on the right-hand side, you can see images, a page up close on the left, a kind of focus on, on some of the images. Deeply, richly illustrated, most of the scenes at the bottom depict the kind of, you know, as we've seen before, the kind of work on the manner that, that made Sir Geoffrey Luttrell a rich man. But then in, in, in the margins, you see very strange creatures, sort of half bird, half plant, um, a monkey holding up, with well, a monkey on its back holding up a shield, this very strange creature up top. There's a close-up of, of, of a couple of pages. So again, at the bottom, domestic not domestic, but farm scenes. You know, as we know, this is one of the best illustrations of farming from the period. But then we have these creatures. This is like a half, I don't know, half rabbit, half dragon wearing a cloak, half fish, half frog on the other page. Some other examples. The, the, the larger image in that scene depicts the martyrdom of Thomas a Becket. Uh, so notice the king and his men looking a bit like a single beast, just sort of all grouped together. We saw that theme on one of the misericords earlier too. Um, so there's that, all that violence, and then there's someone breaking uh, a cup or, or a jar on somebody's head. So again, you know, sheep in the sheep pen, and it's like someone picking apples, coursing hounds, but then you've got 
strange figure of a man, half man, half dragon, fighting with his tail. Here's a slug, or rather snail and bird combination. So, I mean, you know, one interpretation of all this is that, that people are just, <laughs> some of the, the monks are, are perhaps eating magic mushrooms or something and, 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 and you know, they're putting the images that they're, they're seeing there. That, that, that's entirely possible. But remember that snails can signify sloth um, and, you know, the dragon often represents Satan. So this man, this half man, half dragon fighting with, him, with himself you know, could could represent the spiritual struggle against evil, that sort of thing. Another books of hours, um, again, richly illustrated. The illustrations sometimes having something to do with the text, but often, you know, the smaller details in the margins. You'll see weird beasts and strange creatures there, um, have nothing to do with the story, but have been added. Some other from books of the hours. This is from the Ormsby Psalter. It has nothing to do with, with Ormsby uh, locally. It has to do with a man by the other name uh, who paid for it. But notice it depicts um, a monk. Well, you've got Markov the Fool at the bottom on that, that larger page with a lot of other complex illustration in the margins. I mean, this is a, this is a huge amount of detail. It would take, we could probably have a lecture just on that. But notice the picture of the, the woman with the unicorn the knight piercing the unicorn. So unicorns are meant to be guardians of chastity and this implies that this knight is, is perhaps going to rape the woman or perhaps he's going to overcome her chastity in some other way. Hard to say but, but there's something sexual going on here um, and again it's, it's a matter of understanding how they, they coded these images and what they signified. But So if you look on the right hand side Lots and lots of stuff, and, you know, de demonic figures, hybrids, grotesques, and then Markov the Fool coming in on his goat. <clears throat> there. Another one from the same, from the Ormsby Psalter. Um, just lots and lots of, of, of really weird stuff going on. Go to the next one, you can see a close up. So there's a knight fighting some kind of I think it's a cockatrice, a medieval mythical beast. But then below him, two rabbits fighting it out while the dog hides. And that's clearly a case of the world turned upside down, not the way things are supposed to be. Pardon me, and you can see the next one. This is from the Gorleston Psalter. Richly illustrated in the margins, lots of figures that again may have nothing to do with, excuse me, the actual text. A fight being depicted below. And then finally, um, see some examples. There's a fox, looks like, with a, with a duck, and notice the duck says quack. Um, and there's a, a there's a rabbit playing a pipe organ while the fox operates the billows or a dog. I can't tell if it's fox or a dog. So then the billows could be used also to power a pipe organ. So they blow air out. There's a man sniffing a demon's bottom and another man being ridden by a horse like a horse. So these all show things that are, apart from the fox getting the, the duck, uh, are not the norm. You know, what, what does it all mean? Like I say, the interpretation of these things uh, is is subject to debate, um, and I'll just give you uh, some words from from Margot Nishimura's book, Images in the Margins, a useful source. The, the Michael Camille one is, is really quite good, too. No one explanation, she writes, satisfies our desire to find meaning in these out-of-the-way and sometimes ribald images. Um, and I think that, that's, that's probably the best way to, to approach it. So varied are the references, in fact, that 
if any universal can be claimed for marginalia, it is that they served many often overlapping purposes, not the least being to engage, enlighten, and entertain the readers, whether medieval or modern. I think that's quite right. Um, but it, it is, it, you know, it's mystifying, and this is, again, a part of their culture that we simply don't completely get. Sometimes it, it's possible to, to make an interpretation. Sometimes it's, it's, it's just removed from us. Um, but, but well worth thinking about. So for the seminar, we're going to read The Monk's Tale, um, and, and we'll talk about that. But I'll just conclude, because this is our final lecture, uh, by saying thank you all for visiting Chaucer's England. I hope you've enjoyed it. The pilgrims are waving goodbye to you. Uh, we've had a number of encounters with life in the 14th century, and in no small part thanks to the literary accomplishments of Geoffrey Chaucer. And hopefully we'll all take something away from the experience that will continue to enrich us and our lives. We didn't quite make it to Canterbury, but neither did Chaucer's pilgrims. In some ways, they're still winding their way to the shrine of St. Thomas of Becket on a never-ending pilgrimage on which we've accompanied them for a short time. Their travels are ongoing, lived and relived every time someone reads the lines that Chaucer wrote over 600 years ago. Um, though there are numerous unhappy endings, and especially in the monk's tale, uh, the Canterbury Tales themselves somehow escape that destiny for themselves, because they have no ending. It's still still going on somehow, this pilgrimage uh, to Canterbury, in a kind of perpetual limbo. Like I say, we can ride with them for a little while, but then we, we leave, and they just carry on and never quite make it. Um, whatever the endings of the stories that they had to, had to tell us, I'll just conclude by saying, may your endings always be happy. Thank you.